أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله الأولين والآخرين وأشهد أن نبينا محمد عبده ورسوله المصطفى الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Welcome to another episode of our Tafsir page by page and inshallah ta'ala today we are on page 123 which is in Surah Al-Ma'idah the seventh juz of the Quran in the previous episode, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the verses that we covered the state of those people from amongst the Christians who believed in Allah Azza wa Jal, who heard the revelation, they heard the Quran, they heard the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they recognized the truth of it, and so they accepted Islam. Allah Azza wa Jal praised those people because they, tears came to their eyes, and they took iman, and they believed in Allah Azza wa Jal, and they declared their faith openly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors them. And he rewards them. And Allah Azza wa will give to them Jannah. And from those people, as we said, an example from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a Najashi, the Abyssinian ruler, who gave asylum to the Muslims. He accepted Islam and he remained upon that until his death during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then in the verses that we also covered gave to us a number of rulings. From those rulings is that it's not permissible for a person to make haram that which Allah Azza wa has made halal. It's not permissible for you to make from the, the bounty that Allah has made halal and from his provision, from the food and drink that Allah has made halal, you can't make it haram upon yourself. And as we explained in the previous episode, it's permissible for you to leave something off, to refrain from something, to not like something, you don't find it appetizing, it's not something which you like to eat, certain people don't like certain types of food, that's fine. But you don't make it haram upon yourself, and you don't make it haram upon others. That is something which only Allah Azza wa Jal can do. We also mentioned the verse in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave us instructions concerning the oaths that we take when we swear in the name of Allah Azza wa Jal or take an oath in the name of Allah that we will do something or that we won't do something. If that is just done frivolously, because of its, of, of the nature of some people that their everyday speech contains those types of oaths, those oaths don't count. They don't make any uh, any any difference to a person in terms of their ibadah. But those oaths that a person does take in the name of Allah with sincere intention and there's a conviction in their heart that they want to make that oath, then that oath is enacted and they must do it to the best of their ability and they should preserve it to the best of their ability and fulfill it. However, if they can't for one reason or another, then as we said, the expiation is that they either feed 10 poor people or clothe 10 poor people or free a slave. And if they can't do that, it's beyond their means, their financial ability and capability to do so, then they can fast three days as an expiation for breaking that oath. Today we begin or we continue with verse number 90. And that is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إنما الخمر والميسر والأنصاب والأزلام رجس من عمل الشيطان فاجتنبوه لعلكم تفلحون O you who believe intoxicants and gambling, adulterous practices and divining with arrows or repugnant acts, they are shaitan's handiwork. Shun them so that you may prosper. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse speaks to us about a number of things that he has made haram upon us. The first of those things is that Allah Azza says, addressing the people of Iman, that we stay away from, from intoxicants. Khamar is wine and alcohol and anything which intoxicates. And many of the scholars use the word khamar to denote other types of intoxicants as well, such as drugs and so on. Because all of them have the same uh, properties in terms of intoxicating the mind, clouding the mind, not allowing or uh, not allowing a person to use the 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 faculties of reason that they can distinguish between what they're doing and not doing. And so Allah Azza wa Jal or many of the scholars say that this is included in all types of intoxicants, which is often what you find that has been the translation. But the first and foremost of them is no doubt alcohol, wine, and so on and so forth that people used to drink and it would intoxicate their minds. This verse then makes, therefore makes alcohol haram. And as we know that the prohibition of alcohol was revealed in three stages in the Quran. The first stage, and these are verses that we've already covered uh, in our previous verses of Tafsir. So this is the final of those three stages being mentioned here at the end of, or towards the end of Surah Al-Ma'idah. 
Allah Azza wa mentioned that they, the first stage was that when they asked concerning uh, intoxicants and its ruling, and they were told that there is some good in it, but it is, it's, its evil is worse. So stay away from it. That was the first, it's like just a gentle push or nudge, a gentle exhortation that they should stay away from alcohol because its harms outweigh its benefits. The second degree of, of, of prohibition or the second level of prohibition was then that Allah Azza wa said, don't come to the masjid and pray when you're intoxicated. The five daily prayers, meaning at the times of Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, stay away from drinking. And so Allah Azza wa limited greatly the times in which it could be consumed because times the time between especially Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha isn't so long. And then really it's only the night time or the early morning time, which for many of the Arabs would not be a time for drinking because they would be working and they would be doing labor and so on and so forth. And so Allah Azza restricted the time greatly. And then now in this verse, Allah Azza wa says, Fajtanibu, stay away from it, meaning that it is now haram. And so this is the third of those three stages. Also Allah Azza wa says concerning what else Allah Azza wa made haram is al maysir gambling. So gambling is also something which was made haram by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gambling in all of its forms. Because it is something which is also detrimental and causes a great deal of harm. When a person when a person spends their wealth and their money in the hope that they're going to attain more or win some type of a jackpot or big prize, and they end up becoming bankrupt. And we all know the stories around us. We know the addiction of gambling and the harm that it can do, and the thousands and thousands of pounds that people will spend because they want to feed that addiction and they lose their wealth, and they will take the property of others, and they will mortgage their houses and sell off their property and pawn things in order to be able to fulfill this addiction of theirs, this habit of theirs. And that is something which is also detrimental. From that which Allah Azza wa made haram is al-ansab, the practices of idolatry. So any idolatrous practice, Allah Azza wa says that it is something which is haram. Wal-azlam, and dividing with arrows. As we said that the Arabs used to do where they would come if they wanted to make a decision about something, they needed help, in a decision, they would come to these arrows. On one arrow, it would say, do it. On the other one, it would say, don't do it. On the third one, it would be blank. And they would pick an arrow. If it said, do it, they would do it. If it said, don't do it, they wouldn't do it. And if it was the blank arrow, they would repeat the process again until they picked one of those other two arrows. These are people and their superstitions. Allah Azza wa says concerning all of this, رِجْسٌ مِّنْ عَمَلِ shaytan. These are the repugnant acts, the handiworks of shaytan. So Allah Azza wa number one, describes them as being evil. Describes them as being rigged. So rigged is something which is impure, it is filthy because of the harms that it contains. Shirk is something which is harmful. Believing or trusting in anything other than Allah Azza wa Jalla is extremely harmful. Two of those things are to do with the aqidah, with the person's belief, with the person's tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or lack thereof. And the other two are to do with people's actions, drinking and gambling. And we all know the harms that that brings. We know the problems that that brings within a society if it is left unchecked. فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So Allah Azza wa says, stay away from them, shun them, so that you may be from amongst those who are successful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then continues in verse 91, speaking about the evils of these things, and especially the intoxicants and gambling. Allah Azza wa says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَن يُوقِعَ بَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ فِي الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ وَيَصُدَّكُمْ وَيَصُدَّكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَعَنِ الصَّلَاةِ فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُنْتَهُونَ With intoxicants and gambling, shaitan seeks only to incite enmity and hatred amongst you and to stop you remembering Allah and prayer. Will you not then give up? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the reason why shaitan pumps and entices people to go towards these two things primarily, two of the biggest addictions that people have in the world is either drink, alcohol, or uh, or some type of substance abuse or gambling. These are the two major things. People who are into drugs, into drink, and they're addicted to it, even if you're not addicted, because the sharia makes even the smallest amount of these things haram, because they lead to the greater harm. So Allah Azza wa makes it all haram. But addiction to these things, as well as gambling, causes a great deal of harm. From those harms, and يُقِعَ بَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَى It is something which will bring enmity and hatred amongst you. The person who's gambling with another person, they're going to have problems if they don't pay up, if they or if they themselves feel that they're being cheated, that they're being hard done by. How many people do this when they 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 essentially uh, bankrupt themselves because of this? Or the person who's intoxicated, drugged, 
out of their minds or out in alcohol and then in the days and they don't know what's going on they can potentially harm someone they steal to fuel that habit they will steal they will go and they will try to get wealth and money so that they can buy their drugs or they can buy their alcohol in order to fuel this addiction that they have it is an extremely dangerous thing and all of this is known even by society at large it's not just something which only muslims recognize we know now that many people in society know this and they can see the dangers and the harms the problems that it causes in antisocial behavior the problems that it causes in disturbances the fights the problem all of these things that are fueled by these types of addictions and so allah Azzawajal is saying to us that if that is the end result of shaitan then stay away from it don't even engage in it and that is why the prophet وسلم, said that that which intoxicates in a great amount is haram even in the smallest amount because if Allah Azzawajal has told you there's evil in it, then stay away from it. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala didn't say just stay away from the from doing it in excess, from drinking too much, from gambling too much, a small amounts. Okay, no, He said fetch the nibu, stay away from the whole thing. And that is why the Muslim is someone who is extremely mindful. Because unfortunately, even amongst Muslims, we have our brothers and sisters who drink, and especially drugs, which is a big problem in our communities, young people and older people, because of the problems that they feel or the stress that they feel, or whatever it may be, they're into soft drugs or hard drugs. And these are issues that the Muslim should stay away from. A person's iman, a person's uh, tawakkul in Allah, their trust in Allah, a person's love for Allah Azza should be far greater than they need to be able to go. It is a sign of iman that they don't need to go and, and resort to those other things. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, have, do any of us have a life that is more difficult than the companions? Are any of us going through the hardship that they went through with Quraysh, the persecution, the torture, the evil that they had to, had to suffer at the hands of their people? Yet you don't find a single one of them resorting to drugs. There were drugs available at that time. Alcohol was prevalent at that time. The Quraysh used to drink all the time. They were into alcohol. Yet the Prophet ﷺ, once he forbade this, and it was made haram in the Sharia, you don't have the companions going back to it. Some of them were people who used to drink commonly. And regularly, as is found in the, in the narrations of Anas radiallahu anha, from amongst the companions, they used to drink because it was halal at a point in time. And then Allah Azza made it haram immediately, they throw it away and they never go back to it again. They could have had the excuse of pressures and hardships and difficulty and wars and battles and enemies. But no, Allah Azza just said stay away and they stayed away. And so it's not a good enough excuse for the person who believes in Allah, hopes in Allah's reward, wants to attain Allah's Jannah, that they use these types of excuses to do that which is haram. And from the greatest of the evils in these two things, They take you away from the remembrance of Allah, they take you away from salah. Because the person who's gambling, for example, is so addicted to what they're doing that they can't even step away. Some of those people will spend the whole day or the whole night gambling time after time after time after time and prayers will come and prayers will go and the remembrance of Allah is nowhere to be seen they're not going to be reading Quran they're not going to be remembering Allah Azza wa Jalla. they won't be doing any good seeking knowledge doing anything good because what they're going to be doing is feeding their addiction and their habit and likewise the person who's intoxicated the person who's drunk what salah is he going to offer the person who's drunk what kind of dhikr or Quran are they going to read in fact if they did pray or do Quran read Quran they would probably do something which was even worse, they would probably do some evil act in it or miss, mess up one of the issues of salah or read the Quran in an incorrect way which would be even potentially a greater harm than just the drinking as well or a greater evil than just the simple drinking by itself. And so this point here that Allah Azza is making therefore shows that this is a general principle in the Sharia. So these things are haram, stay away from them. But the principle Allah Azza also gives to us here is that anything that takes you away from salah and the remembrance of Allah you should dim it even if it is halal. So for example, people often ask, what's the ruling of playing sports or playing video games or playing... If they are halal, it's okay. If there's no haram within them, it's fine to do. So long as you don't do it in excess. So long as it doesn't reach the level here that Allah is speaking about, that you're into your video games or you're playing a sport and the salah comes and goes. In the winter, you're playing football and dhuhr comes and dhuhr goes and you're still playing football because the match is 90 minutes and you didn't pray. That's a problem. Or... You're in, on your video games and you spend the whole day or you spend the whole night awake playing them and then you go to sleep and you miss Fajr because you didn't go to sleep till 2, 3 a.m. and Fajr is at 5, 6 and you can't wake up now and you miss your salah. That is then something which is haram. It becomes haram for you now. Not because the issue itself was haram in its default ruling but it's haram now because of your application of it. The way that you're practicing it. And that is the way that the Sharia looks at these types of issues. فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُنْتَهُونَ Allah Azza wa then says, so will you not give them up? 
Allah Azza wa Jalla in verse number 92 then continues and says, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَاحْذَرُوا فَإِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ فَعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا عَلَى رَسُولِنَا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ Obey Allah and obey His Messenger and always be on your guard. If you pay no heed, bear in mind that the sole duty of our Messenger is to deliver the message clearly. So Allah Azza wa Jalla after mentioning these rulings concerning drinking and alcohol and gambling and so on, Allah says, Obey Allah and obey His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and be on guard. On guard from what? From who? From shaitan, from sinning, from turning away from Allah Azza wa Jalla in disobedience. Be aware, because that's what shaitan wants you to do, so that you become more and more distant from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and you go towards the path of misguidance. Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, rather obey Allah and obey His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. For in tawalaytum, and if you refuse to do so, then the role of the Messenger is only al balaghul mubin to deliver the message clearly. In verse number ninety-three, Allah Azza wa Jalla then says. ليس على الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات جناح فيما طعموا إذا ما اتقوا وآمنوا إذا ما اتقوا وآمنوا وعملوا الصالحات ثم اتقوا وآمنوا ثم اتقوا وأحسنوا والله يحب المحسنين <coughs> Those who believe and do good deeds will not be blamed for what they may have consumed in the past as long as they are mindful of Allah and they believe and do good deeds then are mindful of Allah and believe, then are mindful of Allah and do good deeds. Allah loves those who do good deeds. This verse was revealed concerning those people who died before this command of Allah Azza wa was given about the prohibition of gambling and the prohibition of alcohol. Allah Azza wa forbade alcohol. But there were many companions or a number of companions that had died before this point. So what they did is they consumed alcohol because it was halal at that time. They drank and they worshipped Allah Azza wa at the same time and then they passed away and then Allah Azza wa revealed this verse towards the end of Surah Al-Ma'idah saying it is now haram. Some of the companions then feared for their brothers who had passed away. What is their ruling? Allah says that it's going to be something which causes enmity between you. It's from the paths of shaitan, from his handiworks, it takes you away from salah and from the dhikr of Allah Azza wa What about those Muslims who passed away before us and they used to drink? So they came and they asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Allah azza wa jal revealed this verse: "ليس على الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات جناح فيما طعموا." There is no harm upon those who believe and do good deeds. They will not be blamed for what they consumed in the past. Meaning, at that time it was halal for them. So Allah will not hold them to account for a ruling that came after their death, and that is from the mercy and the justice of Allah subhanahu wa taala. إذا ما تقو. So long as they were people of iman and taqwa and righteous deeds. And those companions were doing the best of, to the best of their ability. They were doing what Allah Azza wa Jalla had commanded and legislated at that time. And that shows, therefore, the beauty and the justice of Islam. And that is why if a person genuinely doesn't know a ruling of Islam, they're not how to account for it. Like the new Muslim, the new Muslim who accepts the religion of Islam, you can't be expected in the first few weeks or the first few months or even the first year or two to know all of the major rulings of Islam. They will learn as they go along, but they may miss out one thing or another, or they may misunderstand certain things. So they do something that you see that is wrong. You go and advise them. And if it comes and, they, and you find out that they were ignorant of that ruling, or they misunderstood it, or it was a genuine mistake, Allah Azza wa Jalla doesn't hold them to account for that. And that is because they did their best. They did what Allah Azza wa Jalla commanded them to do. However, that is not an excuse not to learn. You can't not physically go and learn and seek knowledge and ask, and then say, oh, but I didn't know. That's not acceptable. Why? Because that is your shortcoming then. You had the opportunity to ask and to learn, just as you do for everything else in your life. You want to buy a house, you want to buy a car, you want to go and change jobs, you want to move to a different country, you want to send your kids to a school, you do your research, you ask, you find out, you learn, and then you make that decision. So why then, when it comes to the religion of Allah Azza wa Jal, I'll be happy to be go lucky people, ignorant and so on. And then when we make major mistakes, then we turn around and say, but we didn't know, no one told us. As if we expect people to come at every step of the way and hold our hands in this issue of Allah's religion and Islam. But with everything else, we'll take the initiative. We'll be the ones who will go and research and ask and learn. And sometimes so much that we gather whole dossiers on an issue, files on an issue before we make a decision. It's your responsibility to learn. That's different to the person who genuinely doesn't know. They're a new Muslim, for example, or someone who's illiterate, someone who's really old. Someone Those people have their reasons and their excuses. But even those people, to the best of their ability, must do what they can in order to learn about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal, in the next number of verses, will now give to us a number of commands. In verse number 94, Allah Azza wa Jal says, 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا ليبلونكم الله بشيء من الصيد تناله أيديكم ورماحكم ليعلم الله من يخافه بالغيب فمن اعتدى بعد ذلك فله عذاب أليم O you who believe Allah is sure to test you with game within reach of your hands and spears to find out who fears him even though they cannot see him. From now on, anyone who transgresses will have a painful punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the believers, primarily at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when these rulings are now being revealed for the first time, Allah azza wa jal says that Allah will test you with game. Game meaning hunting. Game are those animals that it is permissible for you to hunt. Allah will test you with this because they are in the reach of your hands and in the reach of your spears and your arrows and so on. But Allah will tell you to stay away from them. And this will be further clarified in the next verse. These are the rulings of Ihram. The ruling of being in the state of Ihram when you're going for Umrah or for Hajj. There are certain restrictions that are placed upon the Muhrim, the one in the state of Ihram, whether the male or female. And from those restrictions is that they cannot hunt. And in the olden days, because people used to go by land, they would need to eat. And so they would have provisions with them. But if they came across animals that they could hunt, they would hunt them as well in order to replenish themselves and their provision and so on and so forth. They would hunt. That is generally permissible. However, in the state of Ihram, it is not allowed. And that is why Allah Azza wa says, Allah will test you with this. So Allah is warning the, the believers that what you're accustomed to, especially at that time of hunting as you're traveling, you see a, a wild deer, you see a gazelle, you see something, and you hunt it. But now you can't. Even though it may well be in reach, you could probably come and reach out and catch one of those animals. Or you could use one of your spears or arrows in order to catch them because of how close they may be to you. But in the state of Ihram, because it is a state of sanctity, then likewise any harm also or, or you for you to harm anything also becomes from that sanctity. And so therefore they're told to stay away. Allah Azza wa says, لِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَخَافُهُ بِالْغَيْبِ So that Allah will know who fears him even though they cannot see him. And that is from the way that the believer is. So in the restrictions of Ihram, you're told, for example, don't pluck your hair, don't cut your nails, don't use perfume. How easy it would be for someone to go and remove some of their hair to pluck a nail or two, to use perfume that no one can see them using. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, but Allah sees. Allah knows what you do when you're absent from everyone else. And so it is a sign of taqwa and a sign of the fear of Allah Azza wa Jalla that we abide by these restrictions that Allah Azza wa Jalla places upon us. In verse number 95, Allah Azza wa Jalla then goes into more detail and he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَقْتُلُوا الصَّيْدَ وَأَنْتُمْ حُرُمْ وَمَنْ قَتَلَهُ مِنْكُمْ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاءٌ مِثْلُ مَا قَتَلَ مِنَ النَّعَمِ يَحْكُمُ بِهِ يَحْكُمُ بِهِ ذَوَى عَدْلٍ مِنْكُمْ هَدِيًا بَالِغَ الْكَعْبَةِ أَوْ كَفَّارَةٌ أَوْ كَفَّارَةٌ طَعَامُ مَسَاكِينَ أَوْ عَدْلُ ذَلِكَ صِيَامًا لِيَذُوقَ وَبَالَ أَمْرِهِ عَفَ اللَّهُ عَمَّا سَلَفَ وَمَنْ عَادَ فَيَنْتَقِمُ اللَّهُ مِنْهُ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ ذُو انْتِقَامٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, verse number 95, O you who believe, do not kill game whilst you are in the state of ihram for pilgrimage. If someone does so intentionally, the penalty is an offering of a domestic animal brought to the Kaaba. It's equivalent as judged by two just men amongst you to the one he has killed. Alternatively, he may atone by feeding the needy or by fasting an equivalent number of days so that he may taste, taste the full gravity of his deed. Allah forgives what is past, but if anyone reoffends, Allah will exact the penalty from him. Allah is almighty and capable of exacting the penalty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said from the restrictions of Ihram, is that you can't hunt. So Allah Azza wa Jal says that whilst you're in the state of Ihram, لا تقتل الصيد. Then don't go and hunt, don't kill any type of game. وَمَنْ قَتَلَهُ مِنْكُمْ مُتَعَمِّدًا And if you do so intentionally, meaning therefore if it's done by accident unintentionally, Allah Azza wa Jal forgives that person. It wasn't their intention. They didn't mean to harm that animal. But if you do so intentionally, what is the expiation? Because for breaking all of the restrictions of Ihram, there are expiations that are due, as, are, as is well known in the books of fiqh. Here Allah Azza wa gives to us in the Quran the expiation of hunting. What do you do? فَجَزَاءٌ مِثْلُ مَا قَتَلَ مِنَ النَّعَمِ What you must do is sacrifice an equivalent domesticated animal. So someone, someone hunts an animal that's wild. A deer, a, a gazelle, whatever it may be, that's what they hunt. Allah Azza wa says you must now find its equivalent from the domesticated animals that you can slaughter when you go to the Kaaba as an offering of expiation. What are domesticated animals? Sheep, goats, cows, camels. These are the domesticated animals. That's what you must give 
as an equivalent to that which you slaughtered. How do you know which one is equivalent to what now? يَحْكُمُ بِهِ ذَوَا عَدْلٍ مِّنْكُمْ Two just people amongst you will judge. Meaning these are people who know what is likely to be similar to the other ones. And so therefore they will say that this is equal to that, that is equal to, to this. And that is what the companions of the Prophet ﷺ used to do. They would say this animal is equal to a cow. That one is equal to a sheep. That one is equal to a camel. And so we have a number of those narrations from the companions that you will find also in the books of fiqh and in the narrations of the companions. But if there's not one of those rulings, then those two just people look at what they consider to be equivalent to the animal that was killed in its size, in its in its type of features and so on. And they say that you have to give this as an expiation. So it may well be that a person hunts something and their expiation is that they have to offer a whole sacrifice of a camel, for example, as expiation. Hadiyam baligh al that you bring to the Kaaba and it is slaughtered therefore in the Haram and given to the poor of the Haram. O kafaratun ta'amu masakin. Allah Azza wa Jal says, or you feed the needy if you cannot do so, meaning that you can't find this animal. So what you do is you feed the people, you feed the poor people. Many of the scholars said that what happens then is that you look at this animal, how much would they have cost? So you can't sacrifice the animal, but maybe the animal would have cost 400 pounds for his, or 200 pounds or 100 pounds in order to sacrifice. What you do then is you take that money and you buy food for the poor in equivalent to that amount. And that is what you give as an expiation. Or you fast the days that you would have given instead. Meaning that instead of if you can't feed those people and just say that 100 pounds would have fed 30 people, 20 people, 10 people then you fast those days instead. Feed, fast those 10, ten, ten days in placement for those 10 poor people that you would have fed as an expiation. Allah Azza says, لِيَذُوقَ وَبَالِ amri." So this person may understand the gravity of their deed, that they broke one of the restrictions of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this may actually become a penalty that is a dear penalty upon that person, not an easy penalty that they can fix. And that is because Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala tells us that this is one of the restrictions of ihram, and therefore it is something which you must avoid in that state. And alhamdulillah, now with times, it's not necessarily a big issue anymore, but it used to be obviously in times that were past. Afallahu amma saraf. Allah forgives you for that which you did before and the mistakes that you make. But if you return, then Allah Azza wa will hold you to account. In the final verse that we're going to take today, Allah Azza wa then says in verse number 96, وَحِلَّ لَكُمْ صَيْدُ الْبَحْرِ وَطَعَامُهُ مَتَاعًا لَكُمْ وَلِلسَّيَّارَةِ وَحُرِّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ صَيْدُ الْبَرِّ مَا دُمْتُمْ حُرُمًا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ It is permitted for you to catch and eat seafood and enjoyment for you and the traveller, but hunting game is forbidden whilst you are in the state of, of ihram. Be mindful of Allah to whom you will be gathered. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that seafood is always halal in the state of ihram, outside of the state of ihram. And that is from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jalla, as the Prophet told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that all seafood is halal by simply taking it out of the sea and it dies by its own accord because it is out of the sea or the ocean or the river and it dies, doesn't need to be slaughtered, it becomes halal for you. And so it is one of those things that it, a meat that you can eat or a type of meat that you can eat without necessarily slaughtering it for you, whether you're at home and resident or whether you are travelers. However, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَحُرِّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ صَيْدُ الْبَرُ but it is the land game, the game of the land, hunting animals of land. That is what Allah Azza wa has made haram for you, whether that's birds, or whether it's animals, that is haram in the state of ihram. And therefore, if you're out of the state of ihram, it becomes halal and permissible. Again, that is the understanding of this verse. And fear Allah Azza wa to whom you will be gathered. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we come to the end of today's episode. Barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم